Welcome to the Heart Rate Variability Podcast, where we explore the exciting science behind heart rate variability. The material discussed in this podcast should not be taken as medical advice. Please check with your medical provider to make sure any suggestions or strategies are right for you. Visit us at the OptimalHRV.com website to learn more about the Optimal HRV app, download a free copy of Matt's book, Heart Rate Variability, and also get show notes and additional resources around heart rate variability and its application. Welcome, friends, to the Heart Rate Variability Podcast. Um, I have a really exciting guest today. Um, Looking at her bio, uh, I cannot wait to get into this conversation. So Emily Kwok uh, has a fascinating both history, uh, an athletic history that makes me uh, jealous and impressed, and is doing just a lot of work that I think even if you're not an athlete can benefit from as well. So Emily, I am really excited to have you on the podcast today uh, to learn more about your, uh, your, your, your achievements athletically and also about uh, what you're interested in right now as well. So uh, can we start out by you do, just doing a quick introduction uh, of yourself for our listeners? Sure. Thank you so much for having me on here, Matt. And um, my name is Emily Kwok. I'm 41 years old. I have spent the last 22 years of my life in a sport called Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Um, For any of your listeners that are unfamiliar with what that is, it looks like a bunch of people in pajamas rolling around on the ground. Um, It's also better known as sort of the uh, ground wrestling or submission aspect of what you see in maybe uh, the ultimate fighter or any sort of MMA fights. Um, There's no striking involved. It's grappling based and we're looking to submit uh, or control and dominate our opponents when we get to the ground. Um, I started this uh, rather innocuously when I was 19 years old and it kind of took over my life as I like to tell people, um, partially out of curiosity a lot because it was fun and it helped me relieve a lot of stress and put me in the best shape of my life. I turned a 22 year uh, hobby into a professional career. I became a world champion uh, in 2007 um, and 2010 in uh, in Nogi. So both in, in a traditional uniform and out of the traditional uniform. I fought MMA in the very early years, uh, 2004, when it wasn't very uh, socially acceptable for women to be doing those kinds of things. And now I've taken a lot of what I've learned as being a high level athlete into the performance realm. And I get the opportunity to now work with other elite athletes, both in my sport and outside of it, entrepreneurs and founders and financial executives uh, in the world of sort of peak performance. So I would imagine calling it almost like the way we would train an athlete to be a gold medal athlete or fight like a gold medal athlete. We are trying to help uh, others in other industries perform at the same level. And uh, really it's a matter of learning and building awareness of yourself and your high and your low states and using what you know to then harness your superpowers. Awesome. Well, well, let's start out. You gave me a really great nugget there, right? The, the high and low states. So, I, you know, I grew up in Indiana playing basketball. Uh, so I'm always fascinated when I talk to folks who are in the martial arts. I, I did a keto for about three months and realized if I'm on the ground at six, seven, I'm probably done. Like, like <laughs> my, my whole thing is not to get down on the ground. So I, I, I sort of shifted away from the grappling arts. Uh, I, if my reach doesn't work and hopefully I never have to get in a fight in my life, uh, that, that's great. Uh, uh, but if I'm on the ground, it's pretty much over. Uh, so, so I would love to see that those high and low states. I'd love to, I'd love to hear more about your thinking of that. And you know, one of the, one of the situations that, that I just can't imagine, I guess would be maybe what you would call a high state, but I'd love to get your, is locking yourself in a cage with another human being that I believe really just wants to hurt you badly and get you to submit. So, so I'm always, when, when I talk to folks uh, that have uh, done that act that I just think is, I just can't understand uh, from my perspective. Uh, like, like, I'd love to say how you bring that experience uh, into to your work. Uh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> well, I appreciate the, uh, the curiosity and the platform to be able to explain because I think to what you're saying, it's very true that when we don't understand a situation, right? Um, for example, if we're looking at a piece of abstract art 
and we are not abstract artists, it's very hard to know what we're supposed to be looking at. And um, when we don't understand, when we don't share a literal language with each other, it's very easy to shut ourselves down and say, hey, it's not for me, or hey, that's like, highbrow stuff or something that I can't be involved in, or it's lowbrow stuff. And I, I don't, it doesn't matter to me. Um, but the reality is, you know, uh, we all, we're all performing different activities day to day. And, you know, we all have our subjective experience of what these things are. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of us participate in these kinds of activities, because for the most part, we think they're fun. Um, the understanding that I get from my art and the understanding that I hope to convey to people who are just coming to it or just starting to um, see it for what it is, is that it's not necessarily the, the literal look of trying to hurt someone um, or to dominate someone, but that a lot of what I do is about uh, harnessing and understanding and exploring your stress response and your stress states in a very physical way. <laughs> <laughs> so beyond, I mean, like, this is like way, way, way uh, more expansive than HRV per se, yeah. but uh, just, you know, starting really wide, uh, what we see is fighting, what we see is violence, what we see is confrontation. Mm -hmm. And the reality is, as humans, we are being confronted with energy, good and bad, every moment of our lives. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's violent, sometimes it's not. But it, when you think about it, how often do humans actually have the opportunity or the, the wherewithal to think that they can train their response to it? And yeah. so a lot of what I think fighting is for me is it's not necessarily, hey, I can choke you out or I can dislocate your joints. It's how do I respond quickly to something that jars me? How do I respond so quickly to something that makes me really uncomfortable? How do I figure out what I can and can't do so that I can protect myself? Yeah. And um, really, you know, jujitsu, MMA fighting, I think that the people that are doing it are more drawn to it because of what it teaches them about themselves, because of the strategic and evolutionary aspects of it, less so because they're trying to give somebody a bloody nose or, you know, break their ACL, um, which of course you can tear your ACL skiing, right? But, yeah, uh, but, we, but we're choosing to engage in an activity that then uh, activates our stress response. And what I think is really interesting about that is it, it, it empowers you to understand it differently. And you're not waiting for bad things to happen to you. You are training for the moment when they might. Um, I, have a, a, I have a school in Princeton, New Jersey where we teach Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. And I have, I'm a mother of three, but I remember before I was a mother, I had a parent bring their child in and I said, oh, so you know what brought, brought you into class? And they said, you know, there's two things that my child is going to have to do as long as they live under my roof. That is, uh, they're going to learn how to swim and they're going to learn how to fight. And I said, interesting. I said, why those two activities? And they said, those are two activities in life that you don't get to choose when they happen to you. Mm. You, know, you know, if you get tossed into the water and you don't know how to swim, you automatically die. Yeah. If you're on the street and someone attacks you and you don't know how to defend yourself, you're going to be in a bad situation, right? So, right. Um, so I, you know, I like to think of it as learning to act from a more empowered state. And, and that's kind of what we train day in and day out. Okay, I, I've got to just, I got a sidebar. So I'm going to ask my audience to give me a little leeway here because <laughs> there, there's questions I'm dying to ask. So I, I, so the, the first thing, because I, I, I like to say I'm a student of martial arts. I, I love the Chinese. Uh, Wing Chun is the, the one I've been obsessed with uh, 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 lately. Uh, plus the wooden dummy, I think is so cool. Uh, so, so I love practicing on my dummy, but uh the, the, so, so two questions for you here. The, the first one, and this is from a, a person who would love to watch MMA, but really struggles to watch MMA. So, so I understand like the Zen you walk in with to some extent, maybe that's the wrong word and correct me because I think if I'm like, uh, okay, it's the either he's going to try to really hurt me and I will try to really hurt and we're in this cage. So I think I, my fight response would, which probably you want a little bit of, would, would go up right away. I, I wonder, I think from an outside perspective, who's never watched an MMA bout, it might be what happens outside the ring that may shade because boy, it doesn't seem at all like I'm, everything you hear like in the weigh-ins and all this, 
It's like, I'm going to literally kill you when we get in the ring together. <laughs> the, the second, because I'd really like to watch this sport is, I, I guess I kind of, and I struggle with this with football as well. I feel like I'm gaining entertainment by people hurting their brains. And, mm-hmm. and for somebody who studied how trauma, whether it's traumatic brain injuries or psychological trauma really, really impacts neurobiological function and all the negative side effects to that. I watch, and I, you know, when you watch the highlights of these fights, I just like, oh, I know what that does to an individual. So, so like, you know, how do you, how do you like merge that on the way inside where you've got to puff up and intimidate and maybe just entertain? And is there any way for me to watch something I really am interested in as a student of martial arts? while maybe being okay of being entertained by people maybe not getting as hurt lifelong <laughs> as I think they might be. So I think, you know, you, I think you raise a couple interesting points. So one, um, a lot of things in, in, in our culture today, in our popular culture today, I think are sensationalized. Yeah. So from, if you were to ask a real martial artist or somebody that spends their time training in the arts, mm-hmm. I don't think they're really necessarily that interested in the weigh-ins and what it what it looks like because it's really in the practice and uh, the devil's in the details, right? And yeah. so we know from the amount of time we have to put into our craft, how, mu- how many hours we spend not only training, but thinking and evolving and a- applying our practice. Yeah. And so I think what we generally look most towards is in any sort of uh, fight, you know, and, and I, I do want to be clear, like most of the time, uh, what I'm training in is Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. So there's no impact, there's no striking, right? right. Um, but regardless of that fact, uh, it is a real uh, practical art. So yeah. that means when you're sparring or you're competing, there is real risk for, you know, hurting yourself. Um, but that being said, there's real risk in you walking outside your door and Absolutely. you know walking down the street. Right. Yeah. So it's, it's, again, it's a conscious choice to do what it is that you're doing. And I think that a lot of people that participate in it and people who, uh, I think like the true fans of the sport, real, whether you're talking about MMA or jujitsu are really appreciating the technique and the strategy behind it. Yeah. yeah. Um, The impact 100% is not something that's good for your brain. So hence, I did MMA for a couple of years in 2004, 2005. It wasn't necessarily something that I wanted to continue and uh, pursue. But that being said, um, when you're fighting MMA there, it's not just striking, there is grappling, there are a lot of other things that are happening as well. And uh, I think what most people are fascinated by, and this kind of ties back into your entertainment question is we are we, we want to see human performance. Yeah, absolutely. Who doesn't love seeing humans perform at an elite level or yeah. do something that they never thought they could see a human do? Um, and I think that, you know, even in my own career being 41, when I started this, um, I think I probably trained and I fought with a level of invincibility. I didn't really think that something could happen to me, right? Like I was, I was always facing forward and I was always at the front of the roller coaster. <laughs> um, as we get older, our value systems change and yeah. winning doesn't mean the same thing anymore. So things that I would have done when I was 23, I'm probably not doing anymore at 41. So I, you know, maybe this isn't uh, the right answer, but when you ask your 21 year old self, Hey, is this exciting? Sure. It's exciting to look at <laughs> like you're watching energy clash, right? Absolutely. You want to see, see how people are handling that energy um, and to the entertainment aspect of it. Yeah. You know, like I think that back to what I was saying before, the, the true martial artists don't really need that. But I think when you're trying to make something that's a little bit fringe or a little bit niche, more mainstream, they do want the spectacle. And yeah. so you see a lot of things on TV that um, I think they put on TV, yeah. but in reality, that's not really what those fighters or those people are about. I think the people who truly want to fight at a high level, they love the art of fighting. Yeah, And, and it's not, it's not about hurting people. It's really much more about, uh, understanding and really being able to harness what it is that you do in your body and how that matches up against someone else's style. Yeah. And that's what I think is really cool about fighting, right? Is um, if you ever played the video games when you were younger, like yeah. Mortal Kombat or Street Fighter, <laughs> yeah. it's like wh- whoever you are, right? Like when you, if you're six foot seven and I'm foot, yeah. foot five foot four, when we match up, what happens? Yeah. Right? And I like, I think that's what people love. 
Awesome. Awesome. Okay. So, so now that I, 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 I've got so many follow-up questions about it, anyway, but I, I, I want to suppress that urge and, and with that, with that expert, the expertise you developed in the ring in, in your martial arts. And I, that's what I love about martial arts. And like I said, I, I call myself a student and not a practitioner because I, I think there is a differentiation uh, there. I like the forms. Um, after COVID, I'm not sure I want to go to a gym and get so close with anybody just quite yet, but I, that's on my list of to-dos uh, once I get a little bit more time on my hands. But I, you know, you, you've been in these extraordinary situations. I, I think probably, at least from an outside perspective, a situation I kind of hope I never find myself in, you, you chose to, to go in there. And now we find ourselves, um, I, I would say after a two now plus year stretch, and what likely is the most stressful shared experience, uh, shared trauma, I think, and, and our listeners know I don't you throw the word trauma around lightly, uh, that we've been through. So yeah, you, you might not be in a physical combat experience, though it seems like there's a lot more of that going on right now in our society than normal. But we've all faced this challenge in, in a multidimensional, whether it's uh, obviously COVID, but the political environment we've been in, the civil rights movement we've been through. Now we have a land war in Europe, uh, which for folks, I, I'm a little older than you, so, so like nuclear war with Russia is a real trigger for me uh, growing up in the 80s. And, and so uh, how do you bring that, that martial arts expertise, what you have learned um, in the ring and in, in, as a student practitioner and now teacher of these arts, uh, for, for us who, who are really struggling with, with a different type of challenge? I think that's a beautiful question. And uh, it, it's something I've been thinking about a lot recently. Um, I recently had the opportunity to teach the, uh, the NYPD Rec Club. They were interested in getting their female officers and female participants um, up. You know, and, it, you know, I'm, I'm going to use this example because I think this is uh, it's really relevant to what's happening today. When you think about it, um, police officers are expected to handle stress, right? Like not only handle it personally, but like yeah. handle it for everybody, handle right. it for society. Yeah. Um, and when you think about what we do as everyday people, we are looking to achieve some comfort, stability, uh, harmony in our lives. So we're not necessarily looking for conflict. And. I would even go so far as to say most of us probably feel like conflict is wrong. We should avoid it, right? Mm -hmm. um, but avoiding or not seeking something out also means that there is a whole bucket of intelligence there that we might not be tapping into. Mm -hmm. And then what happens with the example I gave before about the parent who said, you know, you don't get to choose when someone picks a fight with you. Yeah. In some ways, it leaves us in a completely reactive state to what's happening around us. Mm -hmm. And um. I am not a medically trained professional by any means, but definitely in the work that I've seen, uh, that, that I've done with people, what I've seen is that when we are not well equipped to deal with stress as it comes to us, most of us sort of resort to fight, flight, or freeze. Yeah. We just, and a lot of us will cave or a lot of us will run away from it. Mm -hmm. And I see this happening more and more so, right? Like people have less and less coping mechanisms when extraordinary circumstances happen to them or around them. Mm -hmm. And I would say the last few years, as you described, 100%, there was a lot of difficulty for a lot of people, even myself, the, the world started closing in in just so many different ways. Um, and, and if I think about it, one of the things that helped me get through it was my level of training. And the choice to, I, I know this sounds kind of strange, but the choice to train in conflict um, gives you a different ability to relate to it. Hmm. Uh, because you're, fa you're facing forward, you're not, you're not turned away from it. Yeah. And when you're facing forward towards it, it gives you choices. It gives you some power. It gives you some awareness. And so what I also recognize with a lot of these police officers I got to work with is the need and the joy for more training because they know what they're dealing with out there. They know that they're going to be given certain circumstances that they won't know how to deal with. And so I was uh, like so delighted to meet such a, a, a wonderful group of people that were like, please, like we want to do this some more because they understand firsthand how important it is to be prepared. I'm not sure that the general public 
thinks that they need to be prepared on that level. And by all means, I'm not saying go out and train like an athlete or a police officer, mm -hmm. but I do think it's important that we have some sort of an outlet where we can express some depth in what we have to put ourselves through, right? The, the, the deeper we take ourselves, the more we know what we're capable of. Mm -hmm. If we don't actually know what depth we're working with, then we're only dealing with what is on hand. And a lot of the times that's chaotic for a lot of people. And where I think that's really dangerous is when you don't have any coping mechanisms and you don't know how much you can or can't do. And let me be clear that knowing how much you can or can't do is a thing. Like yeah. if you know you cannot do X, that gives you a choice. It empowers you to say, I will avoid this and I will do that. But if you don't even train that, if you don't even build that awareness, you're just left pretty paralyzed, right? Mm. So um, I'm a huge advocate for people getting involved in something that helps them train the depth of their understanding of self. And that means taking yourself to places that are uncomfortable sometimes. Maybe if you have people that don't like fighting, but let's say they like to work out marathon running or swimming or CrossFit or whatever it may be, yoga. You know the difference between the days that you're kind of taking it easy and the days that you're kind of pushing yourself to your limits. Mm -hmm. And I think it's so important that we train our limits because stress for me is a spectrum. It's not, I'm stressed out. It's like, okay, how stressed out am I? Right. How much do I need to pull myself back? It's not just black or white. Yeah, absolutely. And that's like with the, one of the things with the heart rate variability that, that drew me to it was like this idea that we can kind of quantify that, that stress response and one of the things like that, that that you know you know as we know usually most of us have probably one of these exceptions to it is you know it's usually fight fight and then freeze kind of as a spectrum uh because heck if i can run away from a, a potential i'm running away but i'm not fast either that, that's my problem like i joke with my wife is i gotta be faster than our slowest dog and i'm gonna survive the bear attack so so, so, you know, one of the things that, that I'm interested in, and the police officers, I think, give a great example, uh, because from like a heart rate variability perspective, they are one of the ethically interesting questions, because if you wake up in red or, or you're really struggling with your stress response, do we want the police officer to, to go out on duty that day, now, knowing that there's actual studies that they make poor uh, decisions, including in those uh, shooting drills uh, about what's a what's a real threat and what's not. Like, do you want your airplane pilot flying the plane? Do you want your surgeon operating on you? They, they fall into that ethically, I just say interesting category uh, because the the their work is so complex. So one of the things that I have really thought about with my work with the, the police force is if you already got somebody really struggling they're more likely to, to go more into the sympathetic nervous system fight response, which is not at all connected to the prefrontal cortex. Uh, now, now you're back in that. So I wonder, you know, if I ask this question right, and if I'm not, feel free to, 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 to make it maybe make sense in how you talk about it. But it sounds like in some ways in your, your fighting career, it seemed like you did this is, I imagine there is, there is some fight energy there that, that you have, you know, you don't want to be totally like in the calmest state ever when you enter the ring, nor if the police officer is at a potential at risk, you don't want to be all calm, relaxed and just kind of, Hey, let's see what happens with this. So if I'm hearing correctly, you're, you're almost helping and you've probably done this in your own experience as well is bringing cognition into a higher level intense situation um, where there is a, maybe, I don't know, let me just drop it there and see if you can make sense of my babbling. <laughs> no, it totally does. It totally does. So um, I I'm going to just frame this for a lot of your listeners, almost as if you're coming in to do class for the first time and awesome. you're doing something that you've never done before. You're kind of freaked out about it. You've only seen people get choked out on TV and you're kind of <laughs> like, why am I here? This is kind of crazy. Um, so let's just take a 190 pound male who uh, is not so athletic, mm -hmm. okay? Let's say they don't work out and they come into class and they're not really sure what they're doing. A lot of people, quite frankly, I think as adults, we almost train ourselves out of the, the natural rhythms and moods of our body, right? So like mm -hmm. I have young children, I have two girls and one boy and they're eight, six, and two. And if I look at my children run around and fall on the ground and get back up, 
There's a certain ease and pliability and motion to their bodies. They do things that no one teaches them that are correct in yeah. terms of how to stand up in a, it, like powerfully in a bad situation. Mm -hmm. But as adults, you know, we're cultured to sit at desks, do things in a very static way. We lose that somatic intelligence, if yeah. you will. And so then when we look at getting on a floor, putting our hands and feet on a floor and learning how to fall and get up and throw somebody and get up and arm bar somebody and get up, it's almost like we've got two left feet and we don't know what to do with ourselves. Yeah. So it's a very stressful state for most people because they, they go, oh my God, I have no control over my body. My, I'm telling my left leg to stand up and it's not doing what I told it to do. Um, you're almost arrested in some ways because it's frustrating, it's confusing, it's intimidating, and it's debilitating sometimes, yeah. you know? So um, a lot of people could be inclined to just be like, hey, this is too hard. I don't want to do this anymore. Yeah. And fine, your prerogative, you can walk away from it. But you and I both know, and I'm sure your listeners know, that there are going to be situations in your life where you can't walk away from it. Right. You know, it could be the, the death of a good friend or a family member, or it could be something really bad that happens to you at your work. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we don't have control over, over the external circumstances that happen yeah. to us. And so when I talk about training that up to a higher level, you're a hundred percent right. When I go into fight, I'm not going in totally relaxed, right? Like yeah. I want to have an abundant mindset in the sense that I want to go in and feel like I'm well equipped to handle myself. Mm -hmm. So there should be an ease and comfort around what I know because I've trained myself to do it. Right. But when I go in, I'm also alert because I yeah. know that I'm facing something, right? And so I, I think about what I do both as a teacher on the mats and off the mats is helping people sort of learn the lay of the land see yeah. what kind of map they have for themselves. You know, we don't want to just have a little circle and not know where the, where the rest of the map goes. It's about learning to draw out the path, knowing what exists on the West versus the, you know, the East yeah. and filling the picture in. None of us have that map when we first start out. Nobody just knows everything. And I think that that's also a misconception that everyone has. People go, oh, you, you're you like this because you're a world champion and it's always been easy for you. And I'm like, actually, I was a 19 year old that was a little bit overweight and couldn't figure things out and was very uncoordinated. And I just had to work really hard at doing it. Yeah. And so I think that this is a big lesson is that you know everyday people who are not super talented athletes, who are not wanting to be world champions or an Olympic gold medalist, um, you can still train with that amount of depth and nuance in your body day to day to teach yourself how to handle yourself better. And that's really what it is. It looks like it's an externally facing confrontation. The right. reality is it's more about yourself and what you bring to the table in those moments, right? So yeah. the confrontation with another person or other thing, um, that's what we, again, that's what we sort of visually see. But the real battle is the one that's ha happening internally and asking yourself, hey, did I show up right for that? Was my right. mind clear? Was I totally stressed out? Was I able to do the things that I know how to do? Was I able to get out of my own way? Yeah. And really that's where I think that some of the HRV training and any type of breath work, like a lot of this mindfulness training is so good for you yeah. because it's now measurable. Before yeah. it was just like, hey, I feel good. No, I feel bad. And then you just don't know what happens out there. But yeah. what's fascinating with technology today is now we're able to actually see the data and we're going to go, hey, this is a better day than yesterday. Right. You know? so, so how do you help people kind of use that insight? Because again, that's what I, you know, especially let, let's say, let's just go out the athletic where I know you work in corporate or police officers are always a great example of this as well. So, so we've got this data now and I, I use the I still fall back on my layman's initial thing why I wanted everybody in the world to, to know their heart rate variability was like your ability to handle or recover from stress. Like, and I know that that's, we, we can get way deeper into the different algorithms and that and the other, but really your ability to handle or recover from stress really predicts so much of our success in life, whether that's at work, whether that's athletically, and we're talking more physical though there's always emotional stress uh, and just stress in athletics as well. You know, how do you, how do you uh, maybe in your own life or in your work, now that we can wake up in the morning, take a heart rate variability score, take heart rate variability throughout the day, as well as other biometrics you might use as well. How does that sort of inform how, how you see uh, uh, yourself and your work with others? Yeah. So I think that, you know, again, um, I was just saying how like before 
it, before we had this type of technology available to pretty much everyone, you know, is you just wake up and you'd be like, oh, I got to go train. I got to yes. go do this. I'm going to go do that. And it didn't matter if you were doing, you know, I used to train six days a week, two times a day, yeah. plus weight, weightlifting in between, like I used to just take myself to the max. And I think, again, this kind of goes back to that mentality of like, I'm invincible. I can right. handle this. Right. Yeah. And of course, when we're young and youthful and like yeah. feeling good about ourselves, we want to think that we can take everything on, but I'm 41 now. And I've got three kids and I've got businesses and I've got people to look at, look after. And I have my own training. Yeah. And so if I want to get up the next morning and function, I can't be blasting through walls every day, multiple right. times a day. It's just not smart. So a lot of the times with, I, I think with HRV training, um, what it does is like the, the data, like I wear an aura ring most of the time. Right. Right? And I like using uh, something like your service or other types of HRV. You know, I've been through other iterations of HRV products. And yeah. um, the nice thing about that is it gives you some data that you can now work with and you yes. can say, Hey, my HRV reading this morning is not coming back so good. Yeah. Uh, maybe this is a day where I don't need to work out three times. Maybe I just work out once. Maybe it's an active rest day. Maybe yeah. I just don't do it at all. And it's actually giving us data to work with so that we're not stressing ourselves out and going in a downward spiral. I see a lot of athletes burn themselves out before yeah. a competition or they, they don't know to take breaks after a competition. And then they're just like 10 months on, they're just, Weekend after weekend, they're fighting, they're fighting, they're fighting, and they literally never get an opportunity to rest their nervous system. Yeah. You know? And I think that that leads to long-term career burnout. You just don't feel like doing it anymore, right? Or you see, um, you see it. I work with people in the startup world. They're running from you know seven in the morning until seven or eight p.m. at night. Different types of meetings, investors. This person wants this and that from them, and I'm like, yo, did you take some time today? to just sit down, do a little bit of breathing and have some conscious space for yourself. Yeah. Would you have, you're going to feel 10 times better if you do. Yeah. And so I think it just helps us not be so mindless about our day-to-day -day activities so that that mindlessness doesn't add up to a pile of dust and yeah. create a big problem for us later down the road when we can't handle the stress three months after it's been piling up right? We get into a state where we become panicked or anxious. And now we have tools that can help us avoid those states and actually operate in more optimal places. Yeah. And I love that, uh, you know, and it's somewhat ironically, but, but maybe not like that the athletes who, you know, I, 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 we, we, I'm sure you grew up in the same mindset that if you didn't get up and do the two a day, and I love how training uh, doesn't include lifting weights. So for me, you were training three times a day and <laughs> I, I was I was doing the same thing uh, throughout college with my basketball career, like uh, taking a day off, not real, maybe after a game for some reason that might have been OK, but but really recovery was not a word we ever used in all of my years as an athlete. So, so I find like the LeBron James of the world. Uh, and others who are in some ways have glorified this idea of recovery and, and holding that. Now, he's, he does this through a lot of technology I will probably never be able to afford. But, but you know, that, that equal focus on the recovery as the training, I, I just think is a game changer. And yet, I mean, I, I work and now I, I have a technology company words that I never thought I would say in my my, my life, but I, I stepping foot in this world, like I, I'm sort of appalled how people work. And I, I look at my social work friends and we're not a whole lot better, but, but it's <laughs> like, there, there's never this break. And I wonder, like, do you, with these high performing uh, uh, professionals uh, who it's almost, I've been in organizations where it's a sign of weakness if you're, if you don't return an email, no matter what time that comes in, in 15 minutes, how do you get them to see that their recovery, uh, maybe disconnecting, uh, maybe taking a vacation where it's not working with a different view, it's actually disconnecting from work, uh, will increase their, their peak performance when, when they need it to be there? Great question. I think, Long answer. 
No, please so, do. I, you know, my long questions deserve long answers. <laughs> so um, I think most people are operating from a completely socialized place. And what yeah. I mean by that is we are allowing the circumstances, the structures, the rhythms, the people outside of us to dictate what we should do as people. Mm. Now, that's not to say make excuses and do whatever the hell you want all the time. Certain structures, certain foundations need to be respected. They give us a sense of organization. So I, I don't disbelieve in that. But what I do believe in is if you truly want to be at your best, you have to understand that your rhythms are not going to be the same as everyone else's. We are all unique individuals. We all, we all need different things to thrive at different times. Um, I just listened to this uh, really incredible uh, interview with Nims Persia, who, uh, who was the subject of the film 14 Peaks on Netflix. Yeah. Yeah. And in the interview, um, it was with uh, it was with Joe Rogan, and he asks him. He says, "Listen, Nim says to him, he goes, you know, come with me on a on a trip. I'll take you to the top of Everest or whatever.'" And he's like, "No, no, 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 you got this mistaken. I, that's not for me. I can't do that. That's for people like you." He goes, "No, I train people and I take all sorts of people up." He goes, "But I'm going to tell you what, everybody's different. If you're a slow climber, you're not going to get up at six in the morning and climb. I'm going to wake you up at one, and we're going to start yeah. slower." Right. Yeah. And I think that that's something that we aren't really trained to recognize that we all thrive in different states and to allow other rhythms to dictate how we should perform might not actually be maximizing our potential. Mm -hmm. I do think that like the Western notion of work, like especially in America, like yeah. everybody's got to work, 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 yeah. work. And one of the hardest things for me to do sometimes is to work with a founder and to try to teach them when they go, hey, my uh, executive team is all out of whack. Nobody's performing well. We're down. Like we need to raise, we need to do this. We need to do that. And I'm like, well, this, the culture of the company often dictates the culture of the CEO. What are you doing? What yeah. are you demonstrating? You're waking up at 6.30 in the morning, looking at your email in your bed, answering emails and text message before you brush your teeth. Then you're, you know, meetings all day. You're not eating properly. At the end of the day, it's 11 o'clock and you're still sending out emails and having phone calls. I was like, your whole team, including yourself is reactive, yeah. reacting. You yeah. are not responding. You are right. not being proactive about these rhythms. You're just allowing all these little random fires to dictate the pace of your day. And what happens when you're putting little fires out? you're not understanding the root cause of, well, where are these fires starting from? Right. So unless we take the opportunity to step back and think about the bigger picture and say, hey, like, where is this starting from? And do I have the power or do I have the ability to actually start to root that out? Do I have the ability to reset my foundation and create a healthier rhythm for myself so that I perform in a better state? You know, like a, a recent piece of advice I gave somebody was like, Maybe instead of pushing your teams to work, 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 work every little minute of the day, think about what you need to prioritize that really is important yeah. and prioritize your health as well. And if you start doing that and your teams become more mindful of what they're doing, you might start seeing better quality work, yeah. quality over quantity. And I think that our society sometimes is more focused on qu uh, quantity, busy work, making sure you look like you're doing something yes. when you're really doing nothing. You're just no. stressing yourself out. Right. Yeah. And, and I, I really encourage, I work with a lot of uh, leaders in healthcare, um, also education now as well. And they just two industries that weren't doing well at all before the pandemic are now really in crisis. Uh, and you could argue they were in crisis before, but it just wasn't as visceral, I think, for a lot of people. And it's like, like these leaders, uh, even if they like say, I want you to take care of yourself, their behaviors are totally the opposite direction. And, and I get the pull of, hey, I got to keep the doors open. I, I got to sacrifice myself for my, my team and this, that, and the other in, in these industries. But it's like, I think leaders, I know leaders, especially right now, but I just think this is a lesson we can take forward is like, they're, they're the role models for this. Like, nobody's going to listen to your words. I, I learned that really quickly as a leader is they're going to look for your behaviors. Yeah. Uh, and if you're not, yeah, and I think your words just point that out really well, is that if you, you can say all the right things, but if you're not living it, uh, you're setting that standard for how people should act. Uh, yeah, and it's a lot way. about teaching, you know, it's funny how ill-equipped we are as leaders to lead. We yeah. do not give our leaders the right tools to lead. Yeah. And 
I think this is starting to change. You know, there is more available to us, but I think it's just a whole different ballpark when you have a leader that's aware of yep. what they can and can't do when they make conscious decision of what their calendar should look like that week, yes. when that leader makes a conscious decision to turn their electronics off and be like, I need to go live in my body for a little while yeah. and disconnect. Part of the reason why people love to train jujitsu, Matt, it's like, it's so funny. I always tell people I get to spend the best part of their day with them because yeah. they show up. And I know for some people they're like, uh, getting choked out for an hour. <laughs> but what's really interesting about fighting is it forces you to be so present to the moment. Yeah. Forces you to disconnect from all that busy right. crap that's going on. And when you're done an hour later, you've tapped into your body in a different way. You leave better focused, in a better mood, more equipped to handle the, the challenges that you came in with. You're a happier person. You go home as a happier partner, a happier parent. Um, a lot of people don't understand or I would say a lot of people can't even articulate the benefit of yeah. disconnecting and creating space for themselves, creating their own rhythm. It's something that they feel. And when they feel it and when they see you do it, that creates trust. And I think that that quality of trust, not only in ourselves, but with the people in the social circles around us is something that we really need right now. Love it. Love it. Okay. So jujitsu, uh, you're using other people's energy too. Am I right about that? So, so let me, let, let me ask you a question. See uh, if this translates in any way, shape or form as well. One of the things and I'm guilty of this as well, because I, I like want to have a war on burnout, like, which is, which is, I need to find better language. I know, but sometimes marketing just makes it easier, but the, 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 the reason I'm not going to have a war on burnout is I don't think it's the, it's, then we're just yeah, wrong language. But I, I see a lot of people right now, and this is why I'm not going to use that language. It's like, okay, I've been under this incredible amount of stress. I'm worn down. My team's worn down. My business is worn down. Our country is worn down. You know, I want to fight against it. I, I think that that language is almost lazy, like my war on burnout uh, that, that I'm only sharing here and it's going to go away. You know, when, when you think about what stress has done to us, uh, put us in a more sympathetic activation or even uh, dorsal vagal where we're more shut down, low energy or sympathetic, more that anxiety uh, mm -hmm. piece of things. I think we have an instinct um, in our society to want to fight that. And I wonder if there's any idea coming from how my really basic understanding of how you use an opponent's energy uh, to your advantage. Is there anything we can do in this time where maybe we want to fight out of where we're at to sort of use what we know about stress to help chart a pathway uh, to healing and back to wellness? Uh, yeah. Um so I'll, I'll give an example of something that I've started trying to do with myself. I'm a natural fighter. I'm an innate fighter. When somebody challenges me or I'm presented with a challenging situation, yes. I want to face it, right? And something that I have uh, learned to, to do recently uh, is to, as opposed to externalizing the fight, mm -hmm. I take the fight inside. And when, so, when I have that urge to fight or to push back or to react, I, I challenge myself back and awesome. I say, why do you want to do that? Like, what, what is it about this thing that's making you want to do that? And more often than not, I find that, there, that the uh, reason why I want to challenge or fight or react is not about what that other thing or that person is doing. They're not, they might not be hurting me, but it's my discomfort. It's my, um, my complexity, my not understanding it deeply enough that creates that reaction inside of me. Yeah. So to, to take a moment to pause and reflect, uh, and I use the word receptivity a lot, to receive Ooh, like, yeah. um, has changed the nature of my response. Interesting. Um, a movie that I love that came out the last few years was uh, on Netflix. There's a documentary called My Octopus Teacher. Yes, yes. Have you seen it? Yeah, I have. Beautiful movie. Beautiful movie. And I recommend it to so many people because for me, what that movie was really about was what we're, what we're not able to see when we're not receptive. Yeah. Right. Like there's so much beauty. There's so much nuance. There's so much information that goes uncollected. There's so much that we don't let ourselves understand. 
because we're so like ready to react. We're so ready to jump on it. Right. It's like, if we just pull that energy back a little bit and open ourselves up, what more can we see or understand about ourselves and the world around us? And I think that the, that quite frankly, the way I feel is like, I wish everybody would take three or four steps back and be learn to be more receptive because we are in such a painful state with each other today where everything is about, I don't agree with this with you. You're doing this to me. And I'm like, maybe it's not about all of us doing things to each other. Maybe it's just like learning to take a few steps back, learning to receive, learning to question ourselves, not question everybody else. Yeah. Maybe that would get us to a better state, you know? And I found that as I started to, um, pull my reactivity in and be more responsive to my inner states that it has reduced the amount of um, frustration you could say that I feel externally. Awesome. And, uh, and, and that's, and, you know, even, even in terms of doing uh, any sort of uh, work, you know, HRV work is extremely gentle, yeah. right? Like it's not, it's not uh, something that really hypes you up. Right. And what I love about that is that it, teaches us that, hey, we can achieve optimal states from being in, in, in a calm rhythm too, right? right? right. Because right. the flip end of that is like, I've also done a lot of Wim Hof training, which I love, but yeah. it's also super intense and it can be super traumatic for some people because it can release a lot of things. Yeah. But HRV does something very similar, but it's doing it from the opposite end of the spectrum. And yeah. so I think that we've been so tapped into like doing everything with force that even within myself, I'm trying to take it a, like, so many steps back and saying, how can I, how can I teach myself to do this in a different way so that I then become a more uh, broad and expansive learner? Oh, I love that. All right. So, so I want to kind of wrap up here of, I, I I always like with, with athletes, especially because I, I wish I could stick like my 47 year old mind into my 17 year old body. Like <laughs> I, I just wish I could like, like I don't want to go back to 17 by any stretch, but like, I, I just look back at myself as an athlete and how, how I was living on ibuprofen, how I would, before Red Bull, we had Joke Cola and I would drink one of those before a game. If couldn't find that, I'd have a couple Mountain Dews things that I would never do to my body at this point. Uh, Mountain Dew will probably never be a sponsor. And I hopefully Joe Cola is no longer around. Uh, but, but I really wish like, hey, why don't you breathe instead of doing some of this other stuff? I wonder with the wisdom that, that you have developed uh, through your, your martial arts practice and just in life, uh, now, now being also a mother as well, I wonder if you would go back to that that young athlete who who may not have known that that uh, really great accomplishment. So you did obviously a lot of things right back then too. But I wonder with your wisdom, what what would you tell the nineteen year old that was just starting uh, to get into your sport? I say this to some nineteen year olds today. Um, I I think that something that I I say a lot now is just because you can doesn't mean you should. Ooh, I right? love that. And there may actually be other ways. Yeah. So like, and I say, and at the same time, Matt, I say it to the 47 year old who has extreme back pain and it's like, I'm going to go get surgery. And I'm like, yeah. okay, you can. Yeah. And I was like, but have you tried going to a massage therapist? Have you tried a physical therapist? Have you yeah. tried uh, occupation? You know, have you tried all the, yeah. Have you tried yeah. all of these things? Yeah. And that's not to say that surgery isn't the best option for Absolutely. you. But it's just to say, like, can we broaden the way that we see something and not just be one dimensional about it? Right. Yeah. And so I and again, it goes back to that invincibility when we're younger, we, we just face life head on and we're excited and we can. So yeah. then we go, I can do this. Of course, I can push through this. Yeah. But I tell a lot of these younger athletes that I work with, uh, listen, you can do it that way. But I'm just telling you that, you know, in 10 years or in 20 years, your body might not thank you for it. Right. right? Or how about if you educate yourself two or three other ways of doing it? It's like, it's like when you're going car shopping and you want to compare three different options for loans, right? It's like, give yourself some more information, give yourself some more opportunity and make a conscious choice. Don't just make the choice ahead of you because it's the only option. We, We are very privileged today to have more than one option most of the time. For many of us that are living today, we have more than one option presented to us. And I think that the best we can do with that wealth of opportunity is to exercise it by saying, okay, 
let me look at what I've got and make an intelligent to- choice, not just a choice because it's there. Yeah. Awesome way to, to wrap up. So um, I got your great website up in front of me, but, but tell people how they can find out uh, more about you. I'll put the link to the website, obviously, in the show notes as well. Thanks, Matt. Yeah, um, anyone that wants to learn more about me can go to emilyquok.com. That's E-M-I-L-Y-K-W-O-K.com. Um, you can also reach me on Instagram. I'm emilyquokbjj, and there's a link tree on there as well. And uh, yeah, I'm up to a bunch of different things. I, I still teach in jiu-jitsu. I'm competing. Um, I do different types of workshops, and I work with professionals in, uh, in peak performance. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, Emily. You've been a great guest and uh, feel free to come back whenever. Uh, I lo- I love to talk about uh, MMA some more. Uh, one of my <laughs> one of my partners also fought MMA professionally too. So awesome. I'd love to get you two together. Maybe, maybe, maybe you can educate me a little bit more. But this, <laughs> this has been a spectacular conversation and uh, I really appreciate your time and your work. Thank you, Matt.